you know, as a Dutchman, you said namaste, so the least I can do is maybe aapka swagat karta hu, namaskar. It's, uh, it's great to be here, and as DP said, it's, uh, this is really truly uh, a great representation across industries, uh, thought leaders that we have uh, pulled together. So thanks for your time, appreciate it very much. Uh, the next uh, day and a half is really about a dialogue. You'll find we are a learning company. And uh, so as much as you will hear from us, I'm sure we'll hear at least that much back from you. Uh, so what I wanted to do today is really talk to you a little bit about uh, the Red Hat strategy, sort of frame the context in which we will unfold more discussion over the next day and a half, and then get your input into this. So as I go through this, help me make it not a monologue, but a dialogue uh, with you. Uh, so to frame the discussion, what I wanted to share with you was uh, the drivers in the industry, uh, the why we are doing what we are doing. I'll talk a little bit about what we are doing as well, uh, and then share with you some of the results we're having with you and with our customers around, around the world. If I were to summarize our strategy in one sentence, it's hard to do, but let me give it a shot. I would say it is about enabling an open infrastructure, an infrastructure that makes computing a utility, uh, easier said than done, but we'll talk more about how, that makes computing a utility on which reside interconnected services for interaction with the human beings as well as machine-to-machine -machine interactions. And does so in the context of a hybrid cloud. That, in the essence, is our vision. That, in the essence, is our strategy. So let, let me share with you um, a little bit about the drivers. So the slide here uh, talks about two vectors. One is the scope of usage, and the other is the users themselves. And it takes you through the history uh, I date back certainly to the mainframe days, but it takes you through the history of the mainframe era, which led to, you know, the PC came along, client-server computing came along, distributed computing came along. There should be another concentric circle in there that talks specifically to the idea of web, web 1.0, web 2.0, and now we are moving to the cloud. Uh, and when we speak of the cloud, whether it's a private tenant, single tenant, multi-tenant, private cloud, public cloud, hybrid cloud, our vision is to enable the open hybrid cloud. And, and the movement is unstoppable. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So the entire strategy is focused around how do we get to this paradigm of this open interconnected services that sit on top of this open infrastructure. When I say open, I just don't mean open in terms of APIs. I mean open in terms of open source. We, as a company, passionately believe in this idea of a thousand points of light. The soul of the company, and Jackie will speak more about it tomorrow when she gets up and in her, in her talk, but the soul of the company, if I were to characterize the culture of this company, uh, DP said it well. It's, it's all about collaboration. It's not about a few proprietary points of light. It is all about thousands and thousands of points of light that comprise the community and then bring in the best ideas into, into what becomes um, hardened code by Red Hat. We'll speak a little bit more about that. That has been the genesis of the company. And as we evolve, that will be, uh, that will be further magnified given the coming together of a few vectors that we'll speak to in this slide. So the idea of the concept, so this, this talks about the coming together of concepts, coming together of the attitude, the technology, and the suitability. <clears throat> this is not my slide. This is not a Red Hat slide. This is Simon Wardley, who actually put together this idea that you need the convergence of these vectors to come together to make open source and the use of any kind of technology, could be IT, could be anything, a true reality. The concept of this idea of computing as a utility dates back to the early 60s, where I think it was Professor McCarthy, John McCarthy, uh, said, talked about utility. This is back in the early 60s, the mainframe era, where time sharing was big. Some of you, if you date back, way back then, will recognize those, those times where time sharing was big. 
Uh, he talked about the idea of computing as a utility served just like electricity or water or what have you. And then in the mid-70s, it died away, this idea of computing as a utility, because all the pieces that make computing a true utility were not quite in place. The bandwidth was not quite in place. The, despite Moore's law, the processing power was not, not quite in place. Software was not quite in place. And so it died away, and again, since then, it has been reborn with a renewed vigor, where you see a lot of business models, some represented right here in this room, embracing the idea of computing delivered through the cloud, through an open hybrid cloud as a utility. The, the pieces that have come together from a technology perspective, bandwidth I mentioned was a big issue. The pieces that have come together today, voice, video, data, seamless mobility, across 4G networks has made bandwidth much of a non-issue. It used to be a major issue, if you recall, back just a few years ago. Processing power is uh, going up exponentially. Software, with things like SOA, all these composite applications coming together on, on a service-oriented architecture, there's a lot of coming together of technology that's making it possible. So the concept and the technology is there, but even more importantly than that, there's the elements of suitability. Do you have the elements of suitability in terms of access to these services, devices, your iPhone, et cetera? And do you have, most importantly, the attitude required to make computing a true utility? We now talk in terms of the social enterprise. We now talk in terms of the social network. And, and you see tons of examples around the world, including Facebook and tw Twitter and a whole bunch of examples that's making that a reality. So the coming together of all these pieces is what is now the driving force for what will be the cloud that is going to be delivered as a utility across the spectrum of usage. Stop me if you have any questions or, or comments. It would be good to make this, make this um, a dialogue. So our contention on this slide, is that the natural order of things follow an S-curve. And it always starts with innovation. Innovation uh, of a new idea. The next emphasis of it, or the expression of it, is around uh, some bills, which are typically custom bills of that idea. It then goes to products. It becomes standards. It becomes mass-produced. And then, surely, and Positively, it moves to this idea of commoditized architectures. And, and this is reflected in the slide, which talks to the original mainframe computer, Z3, back in early 40s, which probably occupied a room about a quarter of the size. The old accounting machines went to the first genesis of a, of a commercial computer, went to a, a, a more reproducible architecture with Spark and, and all the... All the uh, brethren of, of, that, of that architecture, and slowly but surely moved to standardized x86 servers with, with Linux, with incredible commoditization of prices, with hyperscale machines, with grids, with clusters that produced high-performance computing at a very, very low cost. You take energy. It follows a similar S-curve. Started off with the early generators back in the 1800s, and you know, standards were set around uh, DC, AC, 110 volts, 210 volts, light bulbs, and so on, commoditized to the point where it's available today as a commodity. More noticeable by its absence than by its presence. That is a true utility. And that's what we believe we can drive, with your help as users, we can drive computing to. You take manufacturing, follows the same sort of standard. You take the automotive industry with, with the assembly lines and a great representation of the automotive industry and true commoditization is right here in India with, with, the, with the nano car from Tata. I don't know what the cost is, Arun, but it's, it's pretty low. So, so there's tons of examples and it's a natural order of things that in the end the benefits that all of us are looking for is architectural freedom, is the speed of innovation, and the outcomes we're all looking for is availability, affordability, consumability, and all that is commoditization in its most supreme beneficial form. So we, 
as much as we charge for the services we provide, we are here to commoditize IT. We are here to help you and you to help us make it available around the world in a pure commodity sense so that it's available to everyone. The UID example, which DP was mentioning, is a great example. We are the, the fountain of that in terms of uh, what it's being built on. 1.35 billion last count was um, uh, the number of IDs that are going to be generated to deliver services to the population of India. It's such a powerful, ex extremely uh, potent example of what commodities, com commoditization of technology can do. And you can imagine what the, all the services that are going to be linked right into, into this architecture, not just from a welfare standpoint, but from just a connection standpoint, healthcare, all kinds of services linked into what becomes the base with this great project which India has launched with UID. And we are just very proud to be a part of that process, an enabling part of that process. So this, these are more examples of open standards. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see the VHS example. There was the early, earlier version. For those of you who remember, Betamax was a private proprietary architecture. It went nowhere. This was from Sony. And, and um, you know, VHS came along and became the foundation of an open standard which everyone would adopt it for video. You remember the days of token ring, for those of you who were in technology at the time? from IBM, you remember the days of digital net, great technologies, but proprietary stacks that you locked you into one, you know, one vendor. And from the universities came TCP IP. The early rendition of TCP IP, it used to break all the time, but it was open. And because it was open, because you could build great, some great amount of bandwidth through that open architecture, people embraced it, people built on it. Millions contributed to it. And today, it is a foundation of telecommunications. That is the power of open source. That is the power that we would like to build with you as we go forward. And you can see with the work we have done just in the Linux layer, I'll talk a little bit more about what else we're doing. But just with the work we have done with the Linux layer, we have, t we have now the foundation of some of the biggest clouds out there, including Amazon, built on what is truly open architecture. So let me share with you, you may or may not know this. Some of you may contribute to this. You may be a part of this. But let me share with you a little bit of how this process comes together. There is this community out there, thousands of people, in some cases hundreds of thousands of people, contributing code. And these, this code contribution is really project stage, loosely coupled projects that the community is building for for whether it could be Linux, could be JBoss, could be, could be anything. And we take, we, Red Hat, take that code, make it into integrated platforms. We take that code, we harden it. We spend about 17 to 18% in terms of the R&D development for a, for a growing company. We've kept that, that amount pretty constant. We harden the code. We support it across thousands of platforms. We support it for years and years. And you heard some of the videos prior to this. The world's largest stock exchanges, most of the financial transactions that happen around the world, are run on Red Hat Linux. It is hardened code that doesn't break, that scales. And we do that hardening. We do the support. We provide the services. And we make it available upstream. So you can download it for free as well. Or you can take it from us and be assured of the support that comes for our for building your mission critical uh, applications on it. So that's the process, and it's an ongoing process. It's a self-perpetuating, iterative process. The communities that contribute to it comprise very large companies. You'll see some names here shortly. Some small companies, some individuals. It's got a very, very long tail that contributes to making this whole thing much more robust. So we, as a company, if you look at the bottom part of that slide, it, share, it shows you the, the stack that we offer as a company. So this is the infrastructure stack. We started in the world. We're, we're about a decade old. And you've seen some pretty explosive growth coming from Red Hat, thanks to the embracing of open source. 
and the value of hardened code and the value of support. We started in the open uh, Linux business. We now occupy the majority, it was about 65, 70% market share in that space. We have acquired companies since then, some organically developed, some inorganically developed in terms of acquisitions. We went into the middleware space. So now we have a robust platform, which is called the JBoss platform. Some of you I know are users of it. Some of you are considering it. And we have built upon the JBoss platform with additional acquisitions we've made. So now JBoss offers certainly the app development layer, but building on top of that, more importantly, we're offering the business process modeling layer. So we bought a company in Barcelona recently, and we make that code, by the way, available upstream as well. We make that code available free if you want to download it for free. But then if you want to build applications in it that are hardened, you know, it comes from Red Hat. So we bought companies to, to uh, expand the value of it through, you know, through, the, through the business process modeling layers. The things that make JBoss make any kind of middleware real, it's all about service creation, service delivery with agility, and that's what we do with, with some of the acquisitions we've made. We made another acquisition to make the bus uh, much, more, much more robust, much more scalable, and it's all packaged uh, as, our, as our middleware platform. Amazing growth. Our JBoss business is growing at about five to six times the industry growth rate. And, and we expect that growth to accelerate like any S-curve acceleration takes place as people look towards open standards and open platforms to build the service delivery layer on. In the end, it's all about service creation. It's all about service delivery. And, and to do service creation on a proprietary platform that doesn't speak to the next proprietary platform is self-limiting by, de by default. So people are embracing this idea of working with us on, on, the, on the JBoss platform. We then bought, it's been an interesting journey. It's a hyperactive company, to say the least. It's one way to describe Red Hat. But it's been an inter interesting journey. We acquired a company called Kumranet. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Kumranet. This is a company that provides um, the KVM um, hypervisor. And, and I'm sure some of you use, use a product. I know some of you do. Some of you are evaluating it. So we bought that company. We built management layers on it. In the end, it's all about managing the virtualization layer. We added to it, you can see there, cloud forms. We've added to it capabilities for management of workloads, not just within the virtual layers, but also across uh, private and public clouds. So the management capabilities, along with uh, the hypervisor capabilities, along with the management of the hypervisor, together comprises our Red Hat Enterprise virtualization platform. The world, responsibly, needs an alternative to this big proprietary stack coming from one major vendor. Many of you are users of that big vendor, good company. But still, the world, responsibly, needs an alternative, and what we think is an open alternative to virtualize their, their, their networks and their nodes. And, and we provide uh, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization, which is the foundation of that open source virtual software. When it comes to scale, because it's KVM kernel based, when it comes to scale, when it comes to security, there is nothing better to apply those use cases to, to Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization. That product that product suite is one of the fastest growing products within our portfolio and also has gotten an adoption rate around the world with big companies looking at an alternative to VMware or, or other alternatives out there uh, and wanting to make the core of their infrastructure a lot more open because in the end that core is going to be responsible for serving out all these services which in the end need to be open and and interoperable, hence, hence this virtualization open play. We bought another company recently, a company called Gluster. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Gluster. You are. So Gluster is a scale-out NAS, network detached storage play. And if you think about data, the explosion of data in this, in this network world, it's growing at amazing rates. Network detached storage scale-out storage, 
is, is what Gluster does. 85% of the world's storage problem or storage opportunity, depending on how you look at it, is unstructured data. So this is voice, this is video, this is pictures, this is medical records, electronic records, all kinds of unstructured data that can come together and provide you a storage option which is a fraction of the cost of proprietary storage options out there, all running on standardized hardware. This is an unparalleled capability in the industry that we offer through our storage platform. This is version two or so, version three of the product. I can tell you the uptake, as recent as it is, we, we, we make this code, this platform back available to the community. So the uptake in terms of the contributions we're getting back from the community has been incredible in terms of the rate of that, of that contribution. And, and we incorporated it back into, into, into this platform. So that's the storage platform. We've also recently introduced uh, platform as a service. So packaging all these pieces for a DevOps environment where we have our PaaS product called OpenShift, which is not shown here. But for those of you who have big development op operations or just want a good standardized platform as a service offering, we package all that as a platform as a service. Underneath all this <clears throat> is a services operation, which, which is also part of uh, our field team, our worldwide field team, is a services operation that provides incredible architectural expertise. These services professionals are linked to our, our, our product groups, so they truly appreciate the, 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 the nuances of optimizing the product for architectural excellence. So we have a couple of thousand, about 1,500 or so people and growing, and they partner with our partners. We're not a services company, we're a product company, but their job is to partner with customers, partner with our partners who provide broader services to make sure that the product and the implementation is optimized for the design of, of, the, of the product architecture. So that, that is the portfolio we have. As a company, we are constantly looking at new acquisitions. We're constantly looking at organic development. We have major operations around the world. We're about 5,000 people. We add about 1,000 or so, at least historically we have, people a year, uh, many of them in product development. India is a huge base for us. Uh, we don't share numbers, but there's several hundred people in Bangalore. Uh, these are some through acquisitions in Pune. We have a big support center in Pune. In fact, our, our head of support is also here amongst the, the audience. Um, and of course, we have a big sales and marketing operation, which uh, Arun heads up here. He, we just moved him here from Singapore. He's back in his uh, beautiful hometown. He even speaks uh, can Canada and, uh, and all that. So, um, so we have a strong aspirations for the Indian market. Uh, we believe that to be successful here is a cornerstone objective for us. Um, we, we appreciate the, the, the enormous growth potential in the country. We appreciate the embracing of technology reflected with projects like UID. And we would love to have India as a shining example of a country and an enterprise that embraced open source with Red Hat and built the foundation of this architecture with it. So I was sharing with you this community of effort. And if you look at this chart, this gives you an idea of the amount of code that we develop in any one of the areas we spoke about. This particular example is a Linux example. So you can see the amount of code that we developed to make Linux what it is today, as scalable as it is today. And we are by far the largest contributor of code back to the community and then all the others follow suit. The important thing to notice here is not that Red Hat is by far the largest contributor of the code to the community. The important takeaway is the advantage you get from this long tail of contributors to the community of all this code that comes your way. And there's a great quote at the bottom of this, Linus um, uh, Torvalds, who is sort of the father of Linux, where he says, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow as profound a statement as you can get, going back to the thousand points of light and developing code is not about a few proprietary people sitting 
in a room developing code, not sharing the secrets with anyone, but about truly making this an open collaboration amongst everyone. Let's talk a little bit about, about your journey. Um, about your journey and about the journey all your customers have around the world. So the phase we're in today, it's, it's really about, and, and many of you are, are in various stages of maturation, so you'll probably relate to one of these stages, but the phase that the most of the world is in today uh, is around optimizing your existing resources. So it's around consolidation, consolidation of data centers, consolidation, virtualization of your resources to get the optimization, economic benefits that accrue from that kind of optimization. The real game, though, is not just about economic advantage. The real game is about services delivery. In the end, it's all about the services that you make available that in the end create business for you or opportunities for your users. And it's all about workload agility, workload mobility, service creation, service interoperability. And that is the journey which all of us are moving towards. So we see a lot of customers, including many of you, that are migrating from their legacy architectures, Unix architectures, any breed of Unix um, architectures, and even mainframe architectures into standardized x86 Linux-based architectures. That's sort of phase one. And then it's virtualization of that architecture, it's optimization of that architecture, and it's developing services on open source middleware, things like JBoss, to provide the services that, you know, that, are, that, are, that make that uh, paradigm of agility possible. We are working, the services group that I mentioned, we are working with our customers to make sure that as you build even phase one of this journey, you're building it as a foundation to the end game or the next level meaningful game at, at a minimum. You're building it on a foundation which provides you the agility that you need. And along that, whether you use the technology from Red Hat or you use someone else's technology and interoperate with us, that you're building a foundation that in the end gets you to the agility and mobility of workloads that you want to create. We would love for you to buy all Red Hat stuff, but we are, not, we are not religious about it. We are, in the end, a truly open, interoperable environment. So we recognize you have existing environments. We recognize you want to make sure you interoperate with what you have today, and you have some preferences that you have established already. We will fit into your architecture because, by definition, by definition, we are architected to plug and play with anything. This is any product from Red Hat. The storage example that I mentioned is all POSIX compliance. You know, so there's, every one of our products have, are all fundamentally built on, on standards. Not many companies, in fact, I really can't name one other company that gives you that kind of value proposition. This is just a slide to show, I think we have someone from Gartner here as well. This is just a slide to show that analysts are saying the same thing. Well-regarded analysts like IDC, like Gartner, and a lot of others are saying the same thing. Build your future, future on an open cloud environment. And when they say cloud, they just talk about any kind of uh, computing resources that can come together in a flexible form factor and design these environments with interoperability in mind because in the end it's all about the services that, that come together. So I'm sure our sales team, some of them represented here, have shared with you some of the benefits of this kind of architectural freedom. You have two options, architectural freedom or architectural bondage. Pick one. And if you pick the right one, you'll get these kind of benefits. I won't go through all the numbers. You can see some of the numbers. You'll get these kind of proven benefits. You heard the NYSE um, example. The, it was an NYSE example. You heard uh, those examples of the kind of benefits they got from picking the Red Hat alternative. His words were, it wasn't even a contest.
this market is our addressable space. I'm talking about the infrastructure market, the open hybrid cloud environment market is, as you can see the numbers, it's a rapidly growing market. The, uh, the darker shade is the size of the market today. The lighter shade is the size of what the market will be in uh, 2017. It's an incredib incredibly uh, powerful compound annual growth rate. We are north of a billion dollar company today. <clears throat> the addressable market today for us is 50 billion plus, growing to 70 billion plus in five years. And we have aspirations to drive a very aggressive growth ag agenda thanks to you know, customers like yourself. It's an important slide which I won't spend too much time on but it's an important slide for you to reflect on. The agility, the speed of innovation, the architectural freedom that you get with that speed of innovation, the amount of code being developed by the community, thousands and thousands of people, has incredible advantages as we spoke about. Taking that code, which can be quite dynamic, the churn can be quite dynamic, as you know, based on the development work that your teams do, taking that code and building mission-critical applications, life-critical applications, financial-critical applications, depending on the industry you come from, and you represent a, cr a cross-spectrum of industries over here, requires that the code you take is supported 7 by 24 once you build an architecture, there's some telcos represented here as well, you don't change that architecture every few years. You want a lifespan of seven to 10 years on that architecture before you move it to the next one. Some industries move faster, some move a bit slower, more conservatively. We will support it across thousands of platforms for seven to 10 years and in an advanced mission critical uh, stage for you. That is what Red Hat does with this open source code, the points that we referred to, referred to earlier. So this is a slide to share with you that the power of this business model, it's a subscription business model, the values you get from it are all those values that were reflected in that slide, the support, the services, the hardened code, the bug fixes, instant bug fixes, because they're not just being fixed by us, but they're being fixed by a lot of other people. We test them, we harden them, and we make them available to you in, in regular releases and so on. The value of this business model is reflected in this slide, which shows the company growing at some pretty impressive rates over the years. And the, the operating margins that come from this generate several hundred million dollars worth of free cash flow every year. We have no debt. We have about 1.2 and growing uh, cash in the bank. We tend not to keep cash in the bank. We tend to acquire companies as well uh, to make sure that we plow back all this free cash flow into acquisitions, open source acquisitions that we harden and make available back to the community. So it's a self-perpetuating life cycle of new stuff being added on. This is what the analysts are saying about us. These are industry analysts, these are financial analysts, and as you can see with the stock performance, which has its own vagaries based on how the market is doing, but you can see based on the stock performance, the investors are saying you know, good things about us. The analysts are saying good things about us. In fact, there are statements from some that say by you know, 2017, 65% of applications running on proprietary versions of Unix today. Much of the world represented even in some of this, in this room are gonna be running on Linux as Linux continues to gather momentum. So let me stop there and let's make this a dialogue. And uh, we have plenty of time, so we can, before we get into our golf clinic, I think we have 15 minutes or so, right? So let's stop there and see if we can make this a bit of a, would love to hear your comments, your experience with us, comments about open source, your usages.
maybe I can start with one of the red hatters, get them to open up the, open up the conversation. Okay, sounds like sounds like the plane journey was a bit uh, was a bit mellowing, so so we can we can close this, and what's next um, at this point, Strom? Is it uh, golf? Yeah, how many of you are playing golf? How many of you are doing the golf clinic? Okay, great. All right, we'll see you at the course, or we'll see you at the clinic. Thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, sir. You're very good at Thank you, Pat.